Good morning, good morning, good morning. Anyone else uh, excited for the Super Bowl this week? I'm excited to eat. Yeah. Go Mahomes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Uh, well, I had another thought. Now I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for the Super Bowl. What was that? Not chili. Now, usually it's like nachos or like fajitas or tacos or something. Something that pairs really nicely with adult beverages. All right. Uh, I want to remind you of two things. So I wrote them up on the board. One of them we haven't talked about. One of them we've talked about a bunch, right? So the first one we've uh, been talking about for like a week and a half. It's due by tonight. So hopefully that's not a surprise for anyone, uh, but the first part of the paper, 10 points, really brief, right? But you're picking that character from a movie or a TV show. It's due on Canvas by uh, basically midnight tonight. You can turn it in late, okay? So if you don't get it done, it's better to turn it in late than not at all. Um, it's 10% off each day, which is one point for this. So uh, if you don't get it done by tonight, email it to me tomorrow or email it to me the next day and you can still get some points for it so uh are there any last questions about that first part of the paper i know we've been uh, talking about it but just to make sure yeah do you want us to like write the full citation or do we just write the information as long as it's there it doesn't have to be in any particular format okay. so uh so for example if you're doing um if you're doing a movie you'd write the name of the movie who directed it and when uh, but it doesn't have to be an apa format or anything okay. yet for the final paper, it will be, but we're going to build up to it. So I don't expect any kind of formatting for this. It just has to be typed and submitted on Canvas. Uh, there's no other formatting requirements. Yeah. And it does say that uh, it only talks about movies. Can you use any form of media? Yeah, so a movie, a TV show, it could even be a video game character. Any of those are, are fun. I used to call it movie paper, and I changed it to diagnosis or character diagnosis paper. Yeah, it can be a movie or a TV show or even a video game. Um, I have somebody in here who's doing a book character that they were really interested in. Um, so really any character that you have enough information on is totally fine. So anybody else, anything else? I'm excited to see who you all pick, right? Um, it's always fun. Usually I've seen most of the shows because I'm a big, like, I like to watch a lot of shows. <laughs> I've seen a lot of them, but uh, I usually get a few good ideas. So I'm excited. Uh, the other thing that's up here is our first exam is coming up. It's one week from today. And a couple of you have been asking me about it, which is great. That means you're kind of keeping an eye on the syllabus. I love that. Uh, our exam. So I just want to say a few things about it. Our exam will be on Wednesday next week. And uh, we talked about this on the first day, though that feels like a long time ago now. Uh, the exams will be on Canvas. So on exam days, like Wednesday, you won't have, uh, we won't have class. Okay, so what that means is you can take the exam during this 8.30 to 9.45 time on Canvas. You have that time free. But what will happen is I'm going to open the exam at like basically midnight, 12.01 a.m. Wednesday morning, and it'll close at 11.59 p.m. Wednesday night. So you can take it any time on Wednesday. You just have to take it before that deadline if you'd like to submit it for a grade. So you can take it during this class time, which you have free, um, and um, that's why I'm giving you that time. Or you can take it later in the day if you would like, but it's going to be 100% on Canvas. We won't meet in person. Uh, I'll send you out an announcement the night before just in case you forget. But uh, there is a study guide on Canvas that will tell you exactly what's on the test. I would really encourage you to study like you would for a normal test, right? It's online, so you can use your notes, you can use your book, you can use your study guide that you've completed. But if you're trying to look every answer up, you're going to be really short on time. So let's say you go to read question one, you don't know what the term is, you're trying to understand it and then find it, you're not gonna have enough time to do that for every question. Okay, so you get 75 minutes like you were taking it in class. Um, and so if you've studied, you're gonna be in great shape. My exams, I don't think they're like overly hard in any way, they're very straightforward. If you've been reading and you've been here, you'll do great, I will never trick you. I want you all to do well. If you all got an A, I would be thrilled. 
pizza party, right? I don't know, that'd be amazing, right? <laughs> right. Ice cream party. Um, I think every one of you should do well, right? And the fact that you can use your notes in your book means that you should do even better. And my goal behind that, as we're still kind of transitioning back to everything being normal, whatever that even means, um, as we've talked about in here, uh, is to reduce anxiety. I know a lot of people are still anxious to take tests, uh, period, let alone in person. So I'm letting you do them online. If it were me, and I'm like a, I'm one of those like overachieving straight A students, but if it were me, um, I would write out every term on the study guide and have it in front of me during the exam, right? Not only then have you studied it, but you have every single term that will be on the test. And then what you can do if you don't know the answer is reference your notes in front of you instead of having to try and find it in the book or find it in your notes or find it wherever and take up that precious time. Yeah. Yes. So I'm glad you asked. So um, when you look at the study guide, so if you're on Canvas, if you go onto Canvas and click on modules and you go right here at the top, here's study guide number one right here. Okay, and so this is the study guide for the exam. If it's on here, it will be on the test. If it's not on here, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so if it's not on this list, please don't study it. Don't stress about it. It's not on the exam. Uh, this is plenty, right? So I've given you every term from chapter one, two, three, four, and five. Those are the first, uh, those are the chapters on this test one through five. So if it's on here, make sure you understand it. Again, if it were me, because it's the first exam and some of you have taken classes with me before, but most of you haven't, um, I would write everything out or type it out, have it in front of you. Always better to over-prepare for the first exam and then you can dial it back. You don't wanna have that moment like halfway through where you're panicking because you didn't do enough. Um, so just try and set yourself up for success that way. But if you study, if you know all the terms on here, you should be in wonderful shape especially since it's open notes and open book, um, a lot of A's traditionally on this test. And, and I really hope it's no exception here as well. There was a, yeah, yeah. okay, good. I knew, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's mainly multiple choice and true false. There are a few short answer questions at the end. Now I will never have you write an essay. My partner teaches English. I'll leave that to her, right? Like you'll never write an essay for me, um, but it might be like, what are the five D's of abnormality? Right, like I told you, right, like, and you would list them for me. Uh, so, anytime I wrote a list on the board, um, like last time we, or a couple times ago, we talked about the four or five axes of diagnosis. That would be another great short answer question. And you'll get good at picking these out. I think they're relatively obvious when you look at the study guide. But uh, when you take the test, you'll get a score right away, except for the short answer questions, which I have to manually grade. So, um, as they come in, I'll be grading them, but you'll get a score for everything else um, right away. Okay. Please work on the test on your own. I have no way of like knowing that if you don't, but please work on it on your own. Do it by yourself. Study and prepare. You should be in great shape. Uh, again, I would be surprised if our average wasn't really high and the scores weren't really high, right? Given just the nature of the test. And, uh, and again, you have everything that you need right here. If you know everything on the study guide, you'll be in really good shape, okay? So I'll remind you again on Monday, but we won't meet on Wednesday. Take it during this time, or if you want to take the extra time to sleep in and take it during the afternoon, that's totally fine. That's up to you. Uh, but then we'll meet like normal the class after. Okay. Are there any other questions about the exam? I think that's everything I wanted to make sure you knew. But uh, if I close this again, remember the study guide is right here under modules. And then if you click on, let me go back to the homepage here and your view. If you click on quizzes, this is where you'll find it. Okay? I can't change it to exams, I wish I could, but if you click on quizzes right here, that's gonna bring up exam number one for you. And the other ones are, are below it, okay? Anything about the test? Any questions? Anything else for now? You're all gonna do really well. I know you will, right? Uh, the only sad part about taking them online is I always like to tell bad jokes before exams and you don't get that from me when we take it online. Maybe I'll find a way to like upload it into the instructions online, right? So I can make you laugh or roll your eyes one more time before you go to take the exam. My kids just roll their eyes at me. They're all like bad dad jokes anyway. All right. My daughter's fifth grade teacher is like the king of dad jokes. We get along really well. That's what's amazing. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to where we left off. Um, we left off here, right? We talked about phobias and how we treat them. 
And so where we'll go from here today, we'll talk about panic attacks, panic disorder, and then uh, OCD, and then some kind of related disorders. Panic attacks are another relatively common anxiety disorder. So you can have a panic attack by itself, or if you have them repeatedly, then you have panic disorder. Okay, and so we'll talk about some of the criteria for uh, panic attacks. Anyone in here ever had a panic attack? A lot of you, they're scary, right? Um, anyone uh, wanna describe or say anything about about your experience? Yeah. It kind of, so I've had like two in my whole life. Mm -hmm. and it feels like everything is like closing in on you, I guess. Like it gets really like restricting. Like, I don't know, it, I don't know. Sure. No, no, that's a great description, right? Um, sometimes people get like tunnel vision or like feel like everything's kind of closing in on them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you have like one or two also. Yeah. Then you really can't like, calm yourself down. You have no control of them. Yeah. And oftentimes panic attacks fuel more panic, right? They're scary. And so then you start to panic even more about the fact that you're panicking, right? Again, almost like meta panicking, if we will. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Feels like, like I'm feeling I'm gonna pass out and I can't breathe, and there's nothing wrong. It's the feeling that it's stuck is like, yeah, and that feeling of like I can't get out and be somewhere safe. We'll talk about that down here, but that's very common with panic attacks because what happens is people start to fear that they're gonna have them out in public or in a class or in a crowded place and they won't be able to get out, and then that can become an element of them, right? That's actually pretty common, yeah. <laughs> They're the same. It's uh, just the same, different names for the same thing. Yeah. Diagnostically, they're the same. It's kind of like a sociopath versus psychopath versus antisocial personality disorder. They're all the same, just different kind of names for it. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're pretty different. Mm -hmm. Did you have a? Yeah, I was just saying that the biggest symptom for me, I suppose, uh, was always that I lose all feeling, yeah. really, where I just like my limbs go numb I just need like find somewhere to sit down or just fall over. Yeah. Right. And again, scary, right? And sometimes people think they're gonna die during panic attacks. They can be that intense. They they tend to be relatively short lived in the sense that they they tend to reach a peak within like 10 minutes or less. But they can take a toll on you to the point where you might be exhausted for the rest of the day or it might take you days to recover from them. So let's look at some of the uh, the symptoms. So for panic attacks to abbreviate panic attack. Um, you need four or more symptoms. So four or more that reach a peak within minutes. Okay, so again, this is something that tends to be short, like these symptoms reach a peak very quickly um, and then tend to go away. But that doesn't mean that they might not have long-term like consequences where people feel drained for a while afterward. Um, one thing um, that's really common, heart palpitation. One of the most common reasons that people go to the emergency room is panic attacks. They think they're having a heart attack, right? Very, very common. People go to the emergency room, say my heart is pounding out of control. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. It's beating out of my chest. Um, and sometimes, you know, it turns out to be a panic attack. Always, but um, it can feel like you're having a heart attack. And then that fuel. So oftentimes people break out into a sweat. They start shaking um, and trembling. They might have shortness of breath. Or even feel like they're choking. Sometimes people feel like they can't swallow or they're choking. Yeah. Why do they portray people like for like little kids in movies like and they always have an asthma attack? Like, is there any oh, I mean, uh, so when people are having an asthma attack, they oftentimes can't breathe. So uh, it might just be that they have asthma and then they uh, take a, like a deep inhale with their, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot the name of it. You just said it. 
an inhaler. There we go. I'm like the thing where you take the thing, right? Um, with the inhaler. Um, and then that helps to open everything up so they can breathe. So I might outwardly look kind of similar, uh, but that would traditionally be someone who has asthma and then they use the inhaler to open everything so they can breathe. A um, few other things here, um, choking, I said chest pain. Sometimes your chest can feel very tight, um, very restricted, maybe even painful. Um, we could say feeling dizzy or nauseous. Dizzy. Nausea, right? Oftentimes people feel like they're going to throw up um, or they feel really, really sick to their stomach. Um, you can also have um, a fear of losing control. A sense of impending death. And then um, other times people get like a numbness or tingling. It could be like in your hands or your feet or your body in general. Like you were saying, things can go numb where you almost feel like you have to sit down because you lose that sensation. Um, the other thing that sometimes people get um, is derealization. Everything feels far away or unreal. Sometimes people describe this as like tunnel vision or everything feels blurry, uh, but there's a lot of things going on here. Four or more of them really quickly, they reach a peak and then they tend to kind of gradually pass. And you can have one, which would be a panic attack, but if you have them recurrently and you start fearing that they're gonna happen, then you have what's called a panic disorder, yeah. Uh-huh. That could be part of the shaking, right? That's not weird at all, right? Uh, uh, yeah, and when you're shaking like that, it can cause your, your teeth to chatter, right? Uh, almost like if you were cold, right? Uh, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's it's it, the whole thing is a very like surreal sensation. Uh, and again, very frightening. So it feels more panic, right? Uh, panic begets more panic, right? And so one of the best things to do is find ways to calm down so that you can stop that. But that's not the easiest thing to do when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you have a lot of anxiety all the time, your heart is working harder, your blood pressure tends to be higher, and those things can have like long-term health correlates. So in general, it's better to keep your anxiety and stress and things low. Um, because they can affect your health. Uh, but it's nothing, it's not going to be anything like immediate, but over a long period of time, it could maybe lessen your lifespan due to like heart strain. Um, it's possible. Uh, but there's a lot of other factors. If you take good care of yourself, you're in pretty good shape and like have otherwise good health, you're probably going to be fine. Um, but it is making your system work harder um, when you have these, right? It puts a lot of strain on your heart. Anxiety and stress in general tend to do that. Uh, so panic disorder, it's so common that people have something called agoraphobia that we specify whether or not they have panic disorder with or without agoraphobia. Now, uh, I'll share with you, I have agoraphobia a little bit, right? I've gotten so much better with it, but a little bit. Not enough. Like, I haven't tackled my fear of spiders, but I've worked on this one a little bit. Uh, agoraphobia is super interesting. It has like a bunch of different layers to it. In this context, it has a lot to do, kind of like you were describing, like not feeling like you can get out. Like if you had a panic attack right now, feeling like you couldn't get up and get out of here because everyone's going to stare at you and it will be embarrassing, right? So that element of like embarrassment or like social um, shame, being um, separated from a source of security, being not being able to get out. So for me, I cannot stand, it causes me so much anxiety, sitting in the middle of a row. Right. So like if I had to sit here, I would just make sure that I sat like either in the very front. I would probably sit right where you're sitting right there, right by the door. Right. I like to be able to get out very easily whenever we go see a performance like at the Pantages or any kind of like big show. You know, those long rows, there's like 100 seats in a row. If I had to sit in the middle, I sweat and I'm so worried about being able to get out. Like if I start like coughing or have to go for some reason, one of my kids has to go to the bathroom that I can't enjoy the show. Right, so I always like my aisle seats or close to the aisle, right? Um, and that can be part of this as well. You don't like to be embarrassed. You want to be somewhere safe. So sometimes people who have panic disorder, what happens is they 
don't want to go out into the world because they're so nervous they'll have a panic attack and embarrass themselves or have a panic attack and not be able to get somewhere where they can be alone and be safe. So you see people kind of become reclusive um, and stay at home. They won't leave their house. Um, there was a, a Netflix show, A uh, Woman in the Window. I don't know if any of you saw it, right, where she suffers from agoraphobia. Yeah. Yeah. How was I haven't read the book. Was it a good book? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard the book was better than the show, but um, I haven't. I haven't uh, read the book. Yeah. And I think that's so weird. Maybe Bojo can testify for that or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Like the two things that Teen Boy. Yeah. Yeah. So only because Teen Boy, and I think maybe Bojo's a lot more realistic in the show. Interesting. Maybe recommend the book first, right? <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, it, there's a lot of shows. And it's interesting because it's almost always a writer. Right, writers are commonly portrayed as having this, like um, in in shows and in movies. Uh, but it is a relatively common, very complex phobia that tends to go with panic disorder. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. They do that oftentimes when so they'll do like a you know focus groups to see like what's going to make it a more successful show. Like, uh, and it might be that just the producer of the show didn't like that it was a certain demographic in the book, but it's good enough that we, if we change that, it'll be fine. It's so common. I mean, think about uh, think about like Harry Potter and like Lord of the Rings and all those, they make all these little changes in the movies and you watch it and you're all mad. Like, no, that's not how it went, right? Um, it's so common that they just make little edits like that to make it more popular and more successful. Anything else here related to these? Any other like comments or stories, panic attacks, agoraphobia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. People nodding all around you. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost like a, a release, like everything reaches such a peak that you almost have a crash that comes afterward. And that's really, really common as well, that people will have like an emotional just like collapse afterward because they're so exhausted. It takes a toll. It's, it's a lot going on and there's a lot of fear with that and you can almost have that wash of relief too when it starts to to pass yeah the most recent one i had was like three years ago and i had like a full like out of body experience yep where, like you must say i felt like i was like literally watching over myself like mm -hmm. as i was like yeah, i literally thought i died yeah and i've seen people nod that's that's not <laughs> uncommon yeah as well right and when they get intense like that you can feel like everything's unreal or you're not even connected to yourself anymore mm -hmm. yeah before like the school day one time in high school which is already anxiety now in high school but um <laughs> i woke up and i felt like i had like a fever because like somebody was saying that they're like your teeth are like they chatter mm -hmm. it kind of feels like like you're sweating you're hot but you're also freezing yeah like you don't your body doesn't like maintain anything at all so, yeah like, your temperatures are all over the place but like i'm like sweating i'm so hot but i'm like i need to get like, covered in the blanket but mm -hmm. i just like can't i yeah. can't even think about it yeah. And it's a lot of you. I mean, think how many of you just just hearing your stories. A lot of you have had these. Right. I've had a panic attack before. Like they're they're scary and it causes a lot of physical discomfort and then emotional like release and letdown afterward. Thankfully, most of the time they, they can be really isolated. Right. But what makes them like anxiety inducing for people is they're not necessarily triggered by anything. Right. There's not a specific trigger. And so then people have this constant fear that they're going to have them again because there wasn't a specific trigger. So it's like, what's going to happen? Like, is it going to happen today? And then people become so nervous about that that they stop going out because they don't want to have it in public. So it's kind of this vicious cycle that people have. Yeah. Is there people who have Yeah. Yeah. Why would you want to make it smaller? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's probably just out of like concern or or fear, right? For not maybe not knowing what's going on, thinking it is a heart attack or something to that effect. 
typically people who are having a panic attack like to withdraw and be alone. Uh, typically, not everyone, but a lot of people, their way of coping with it is to go somewhere quiet or put on like music or do something to distract and calm down. And so having people swarm you could do the opposite, right? Um, unless that's something that would, some people might prefer that, but usually people will isolate to make themselves feel better. This has a lot of biological elements to it. Um, genetics, as we could say with most disorders, um, abnormalities in the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is thought to play a role in this. So when people have panic attacks, they might receive an antidepressant, which traditionally works on norepinephrine along with a few other uh, neurotransmitters. And so uh, there's a part of the brain called the locus ceruleus, which is really, really dense in norepinephrine receptors. And so it's thought to maybe be something with that, something with uh, norepinephrine itself and those receptors. So a lot of medications, people can take a medication like an antidepressant to control the norepinephrine to thereby reduce the likelihood of having one of these. Uh, the other thing that we often work a lot on is the cognitive element. And you're seeing that that's a couple of times now we have the cognitive and biological together of trying to kind of uh, maybe educate somebody a little bit. Okay, so this is what's happening. If you realize that it's not a heart attack, that you're not gonna die, you can start to calm yourself down a little bit, right? Uh, okay, I'm having a panic attack. I've had one of these before. This is what I need to do. Uh, maybe it's distracting yourself in some way. Uh, and so like they're learning about like what's going on in your body and interpreting it differently, right? So some people have a higher anxiety sensitivity. And so when they start to react to things, they, they over-interpret them and then they start to panic about the panic and the worry and it all builds, right? So if we can kind of stop that and reduce the misinterpretation, educate you a little bit, teach you coping skills, uh, that can be really helpful. It might just be as simple as distraction, right? That somebody is starting to have a panic attack and you're able to kind of rein it in and distract them or distract yourself and prevent it from happening. So these are the two big ones, right? A lot of biological stuff, medication, and then working on anxiety, sensitivity, education, and better coping skills. Anything else here? Any uh, other like thoughts or comments? Anything else with panic attacks, panic disorder? Yeah. Yeah, there you at it. What does that do with that? Yeah, norepinephrine plays a lot of roles. It has a big part in depression. It has a role in like alertness and like energy, uh, mm -hmm. which can also play a role with like anxiety. Too much of it or not enough of it can also cause things like anxiety. So it's a neurotransmitter like dopamine or serotonin. Um, and it plays a big role in things like anxiety and depression. Like depression, it's a big culprit as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. Typically, but like uh, it can kind of be, it can depend on the person. And the hard part is we don't have the ability to test for these things. Like it's all kind of speculative, right? We're assuming that maybe you have too much or too little based on how you react to a drug that increases or decreases it. But we don't have a test yet where we can go and like, like a hormone, you can test how much is in your blood, right? You can go and test how much estrogen somebody has in their blood but you can't test how much norepinephrine they have in their like system. Uh, maybe one day, maybe one day. Yeah. 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 And really interesting. That came out like um, just last year, right? Toward the end of last year, there was a whole like meta analysis that was done. This huge study that was looking at all these results saying that maybe antidepressants don't actually work the way that we thought they do, and that maybe norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin aren't as much of a culprit as we thought. Um, but uh, even that's not definitive, but it's it's thought provoking, right? There's uh, so much that we don't know. And we're all kind of like speculating on. So yeah, we'll see. It'll be interesting to see where that goes from here, because it's one of the first times we've proposed that, hey, maybe these things don't play as big of a role as we thought, right? Wild, yeah, I read that last uh, last semester it came out. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the next one we'll talk about is OCD. But before we get to OCD, we have to talk about superstitions, right? Because these directly relate to OCD, right? Superstitious beliefs are like the core of obsessive compulsive disorder. And every single one of us 
has superstitious beliefs, right? Maybe just one, right? But we engage in them. They're very common. Superstitions are beliefs or practices surrounding like luck or prophecy, maybe even spiritual beings. Uh, it's this irrational belief that future events can be influenced or foretold by specific unrelated prior events. So if I don't do X, then Y will happen, right? And oftentimes they're not connected at all, but we get um, caught up in very superstitious thinking when it comes to OCD. Uh, I just thought about Bruno. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno, right? He's very superstitious and we don't step on cracks. That's going to be in my head all day. Uh, there's a million of them, right? What a day keeps the doctor away. An apple, right? Step on what and break what? Yeah, so when you're mad at your mom, every crack you can find, right? Definitely. Um, good luck to carry a rabbit's foot, right? Uh, bad luck to walk under a ladder. Bad luck to break a mirror. mirror. And black water, bad luck. I have two. I'm screwed, right? Black cats, right? Well, one's black and white. Binks, but, uh, what are some other ones? Anyone else have a another like common superstitious belief? Yeah. Yeah, throwing salt over your shoulder. It's to blind the demons that are lurking behind you, as a side note. Uh, it was thought to be really bad luck to spill salt because it's so expensive, or it was. And now it's so cheap, right? But it used to be really expensive. And so when you spilled it, you had to throw salt over your shoulder to blind the demons lurking behind you. It's random for you, yeah. Um, in, in Marine Corps, you cannot bake or to take prunes on AAB because one of them is sunk in World War II going to one of the islands in the Pacific. Okay. And now it's like bad luck. Like there was a dude who had like a Dr. Pepper and they have like some prune juice in there a little bit. Yeah. And like the AAB <laughs> caught on fire and shit. Oh, yeah. So it was all his yeah. fault. All his yeah. fault. That Dr. Yeah. Pepper sunk it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And there's so many cultural ones, right? That like the culture of the of the military, right? Has that superstition. Yeah. Yeah. The 13th floor, right? Friday the 13th, the 13th floor. Judas was the 13th guest at the Last Supper. So it's thought to be a bad luck thing. Uh Friday the 13th is just a fun day to watch horror movies for me, but yeah. like, but bad luck. And most big hotels don't have a 13th floor. Apartment buildings, yeah. Yeah, they just skip it. Yeah, yeah, they just skip it in the elevator. Yeah, if you go on a cruise ship, yeah, 44 days, by the way. Um, cruise ship, right, I'm so counting. I'm like, it's almost a month, I'm so ready. Uh, but yeah, even on a cruise ship, it goes 12 and then 14. Like, they just skip it, right? Yeah. Yeah, right, it's something with your soul, right? Like, it, like it'll steal your soul if you open the umbrella. My children are doomed, they do it all the time, yeah. It could be, it could be, right? Um, like things around numbers and even in odd numbers are really common too. A lot of people have a like, it has to balance or it has to be even. Yeah. Uh, I have two things. So one is with the number four because I always wear a four, four, four necklace. Okay. And um, someone at my work was like, oh, like, because um, they're saying how in their culture, like four is like a really unlucky number. Mm. And so if they like, know someone if they're like a dress or like their credit card number has a four in it like they like try and get it changed okay as soon as they can interesting yeah but uh, the other thing I had was is like saging like yeah. the area you're in like cleansing mm -hmm. yeah thing. cleansing right uh, and trying to like and that would be maybe a good example right you're cleansing to try and get rid of negative energy yeah a lot of superstitions yeah of course, right? All the little things to do, have someone kiss the dice, shake the dice, right? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? A lot of things, right? Yeah, if you see the bride, like before the wedding, it's bad luck and, and so on. Yeah, there's a bunch of things around weddings. Yeah. Don't face their bed towards a mirror. Uh -huh. Or believe that if you put two mirrors across each other, it creates like a portal. Right? Yeah, there's things with mirrors too, right? right. <laughs> You're like, I'm in trouble. And then we'll add my two black cats and just build the the mirror, right? <laughs> yeah. Thirteen was actually a lucky number. It's mm -hmm. Just about played that long. Number. Yeah. Just a number of years. Yeah, and then it became unlucky, right? Uh, for a time. Yeah, I, I mean, thirteen's probably might be my favorite number, actually, or twelve. Twelve. Yeah. 
walking under a ladder. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I get right? paranoid as shit about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, walking under a ladder is supposed to be really bad luck. How about uh, knocking on wood? Oh, how many we knock on wood? Right? I do it all the time. Like I said something yesterday, my partner was like, "You better knock on wood." I was like, "Okay, done." Right? Knocking on wood. Right? So it was thought that good spirits lived in trees, and so if you knock on anything made of wood, made of trees you're calling upon the good spirits to bring you good fortune and look out for you, right? So when you knock on wood, right? Or saying, uh, bless you when somebody sneezes, right? It's because in the past, if people sneeze, they had the plague, they were going to die. So God bless you on your journey to the afterlife, right? Um, we don't necessarily mean that so much when we say it now, but but that's where it comes from. I thought There's a, when people say like, bless you when you sneeze, I thought it was because like your heart stops for a second. Like, oh, it was, it was thought that it was because you were going to die. Yeah. right yeah there was a did you have your do you have your hand up for a second wait sh i'm sorry i can't i can't hear him yeah are they horseshoes yeah i think good luck right a good luck token yeah yeah interesting <laughs> i don't know you're at mine my uh, partner's family is Hispanic and it's always, it's uh, Vicks. You got to rub Vicks on everything. Oh, like, so whenever my kids are sick, they just smell like a Vicks bomb. Like, it's just all over their hands, their feet, their stomach. I'm like, I didn't even grow up that way. But, but you know, I don't know if it works or not. But there's a million things like that, like homeopathic kind of stuff, right? There's just so many of them. And uh, if you're performer right you don't say good luck right it's bad luck to say good luck on opening night right now uh, yeah or break a leg or break yeah i gotta say break a leg instead there's a million of them yeah yeah oh okay reasons not to eat fruit i like those <laughs> uh -huh. okay okay mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because there are there are a lot of cultural ones like that place things that are different from place to place, and uh, oh, I had a like a performers and athletes are notorious with this, right? Watch any like professional um, athlete, baseball players when they go up, they have a routine before when they go up to the plate, certain number of times they flip the bat, undo or redo like the batting glove, step in and out of the box, right? They, these little routines that they get into. If I don't follow it, I'm not going to get a good hit. Or when they go to do a, like a free throw, um, you know, how many times they flip the ball or dribble it or what they do. And then people get caught up in superstitions. Like if I don't wash that lucky sock, like we're going to win, right? Like you can't wash that piece of clothing. Uh, there was a commercial on this, like with Mahomes in his shirt the other day. Like it was on TV that he uh, didn't wash his practice jersey because they wanted him to win. If you wash the jersey, you wash away the luck. Right now, so many things like that, uh, especially with athletes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a nurse for a theater, you know, that theater that's safe. Yeah. Theater. Right. And I, I heard stories from them, but like, yeah, one time they, some kid did that just as a joke. And then, like, sometime soon after in the dressing room, he slipped. Uh oh. And like, cracked his head on the like, dressing room. Yeah. 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 And that's what these things get reinforced, right? Like, if there's something bad happens when they do one of them, and then all of a sudden it's like, you can't do that or else, right? Uh, and that's the root of superstitious thinking is that if I don't do X, something bad will happen. Or if I do this, something bad will happen. And people get caught up in that and it can escalate to things like OCD. Now, nothing wrong with having superstitious thinking, right? Like, especially with my sports, I'm so superstitious. Like, if I don't wear, like, my lucky jersey, like, they're going to lose, right? Like, the that year that the Patriots were undefeated and went 18-0 and and then lost in the Super Bowl, totally my fault. Well, actually, it's my partner's fault. She washed my jersey right before the Super Bowl, and they lost. It's all, it's all her fault. I yelled at her, and we fought for, like, two weeks over it. And I'm like, it's because of you. She's like, are you serious? You're not watching football anymore. And so like we get caught up in these thoughts of like, if I don't do this, something bad will happen. And when it becomes that linked and that uh, intense, we transition into this role. So nothing wrong with a little bit of that thinking, but when it goes unchecked or out of control, it can become this. Did you have a, a thought? Oh, no, I was going to say my ex-wife's friend's husband, he does that shit. He's got like his Northwestern jersey that he mm -hmm. hasn't washed in like 15 some yeah. years. Yeah. And he fucking never fails to wear it when they play. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so it common. Like shit. <laughs> At what cost, right? At what cost, right? Nobody wants to come over, but they won, right? Yeah.
like superstition yeah. or whatever. Like, Hold on, let's keep it there so we can hear. Whenever I like, get the phone or like say bye to someone, I always yeah. say like love you because I like so like I don't know. I mean, like, you never know if yeah. you will talk to them again. I think it's a good practice, right? I do the same, right? Just because you never know, right? So um, with OCD, we have thoughts and compulsions. We have two different elements here, right? So people have of these disturbing thoughts, and then they perform senseless rituals. So if we define obsessions and compulsions here, just to break it down, obsessions are the thoughts and images, uh, like thoughts, images, or impulses that occur over and over again to you, and they feel out of your control, right? So these are the thoughts, the disturbing thoughts. If I don't do X, I'm going to get sick. If I don't check this, something's going to happen, right? Um, it's the thought that happens over and over again in your head. And then the compulsions are the behaviors that you perform typically according to some kind of rule. So very common over the last couple of years, people having obsessions around contamination, right? Getting sick, getting germs. So I have to wash my hands a certain number of times or according to a certain ritual to avoid getting sick, right? Or use hand sanitizer in a certain way or in a certain frequency to avoid getting sick. Uh, checking behaviors are really common. Did I turn th something off? Did I lock something? I had a student, this was like six years ago at this point, who would get up out of her seat multiple times a class, disappear for about five minutes, and then be back. Every time she came back, she was all sweaty. I'm like, where, where did you go? I was so curious, like in my mind, because I didn't notice it for like a week or two. And then all I could do was notice it. Every time she'd get up, I'm like, where is she going? I was so curious. And so she would get up like four or five times a class. And yeah, and she was going out to her car. So after this lecture, she came up to me. She's like, have you ever wondered where I go? And I was like, oh my God, yes. Like, <laughs> are you going to tell me? I've been wondering for weeks. And she's like, well, I just realized as we were talking about this, that I have OCD and like, and what I do, and I'm like, I'm dying here. I got to know. She's like, I go out and I check my car. And she's like, I have to run because I park, you know, kind of far away. And I'm like, that's why you're all sweaty, right? It's all coming together. But she's like, I have to run. I run to my car to make sure I locked it. Um, because I'm worried someone will steal it. And I'm like, that's what you're doing four or five times a class, checking your car. And she's like, yeah, it causes me so much stress. And I was like, I'm glad you told me. And I'm like, I'm not going to let you do it anymore. <laughs> and she's like, oh, what? <laughs> like, she looks so panicked. I felt guilty. And I was like, I challenge you next class. Don't leave for one class. She didn't show up the next class. I felt so guilty. Like the whole time I was like, oh my God, I'm a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> Then she came back the following class and she's all like, I wasn't feeling well. And I was like, okay, I thought it would be, might have still been. But uh, after that, she didn't leave that whole class. I was like, I will be watching you. And she sat there and she was sweating. And I like, again, I feel awful. Like, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said anything. But she was sweating. But after class, she's like, I made it. I made it. I'm going now, but I made it. Right? And I'm like, but you made it. And she went, her car was still there. Nothing bad had happened. And she, she, from there on out, never left the class again. And I think she might've been afraid that I would call her out on it, but it worked, right? I felt brilliant at that point. Not so much. <laughs> but that, this people like feel like they have to go check or something bad's gonna happen, right? And you literally can't focus on anything else. It takes up so much of your energy. We all have a little bit of this. Like everyone has a little bit of almost every disorder. Like every night before I go to bed, I check the front door, right? To make sure it's locked right? I check it. I lock it. Sometimes I'll like unlock it and relock it just to make sure I actually locked it. And then I go to bed, right? I would say it would even still be okay if like a few minutes later, I'm like, did I, did I lock it? I can't remember. I go check and then I let it go. But let's say I'm laying in bed and I can't sleep because I'm so convinced I didn't really lock the door, right? Or I go get up and I like lock it and unlock it five times now just to make sure. And I have to do it that way every time. Or maybe my partner locks it and I don't believe that it's actually locked. So I have to go get up and check it again, right? When it starts to take up at least an hour or more of your day, that's when we start to say it's passed from like, like, okay. And like normal into the realm of a disorder. And for some, this can take up hours. Yeah. 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 And so usually these can be related to like one thing and one thing only, or it can be very broad in a lot of different things. Um, and it can cross over. Anxiety disorders can have a lot of like comorbidity with each other. Wow. Okay. 
every time you make sure the door is locked. Yeah. And I would say that that is an appropriate response. Like if you know somebody who had something bad happen to them because of something to be more paranoid about it, I would say it's completely normal, um, you know, but it can obviously go beyond that and become a phobia or, or something like OCD, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, right? Um, there is definitely some like comorbidity, like coexistence between the two. It doesn't always have to be, but it could be that you have some like ritualistic things that you do um, in order to either help or maybe there are things that exacerbate it. It can go either way. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Okay. So, for example, if I move, if he put his my water bottle here and I moved it, he would tell me to move it back so that he can move it himself. Interesting. Okay. And the same thing with light switches. He always had to be the last one out of the house. Yeah. You get in the car, jump back out, you make sure it's locked. Mm -hmm. And my mom was always about locking the doors all the time since we were kids too. But he always had to do it, and if we did it by accident without knowing, it's you know we're turning a light off. Yeah, so, mindlessly, right? Yeah. yeah he would. <laughs> Me come downstairs because he would not be able to leave the, the kitchen and left the light with background. Yeah. yeah, right. And that balance or that control, like that oftentimes has a piece with it. A lot of this is control. You're trying to control the anxiety by doing a compulsion, right? By doing some kind of behavior. Um, and that's why it's an anxiety disorder. You have the anxiety and then you do something to try and fix it. And they keep reinforcing each other. And you have to eventually break the cycle in order to, to stop it. I'll go here and then I'll come over here. Yeah. OCD thing, or for just like more of a safety thing, or control, or both, or all of it. Sure. But when I would drive with my dad when I was younger, he would have to turn off the car completely until I got out. Like I couldn't huh. get out of the car until the car was off. Like okay. If I tried to open the door, he'd get mad. Mm -hmm. But now when I drive, he's out of the car before I can turn it off. I'm like, <laughs> well, okay. I'm yeah. Like, right. You're like, I need an explanation here. <laughs> yeah. It's Right, and it might have been a control thing for sure. It could have been. It's hard to say. You should ask. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a difference there for sure. Yeah, I'll go right here. And then when it comes to my notes, if I'm doing them in purple, and like I have to have three colors, like within the purple range. Okay. Or like in my desk, I have like the folders, and you put them represent something like biology's always been green, or this has always been red. And I'm like, if somebody messes with something with like in my environment, the way I said it, yeah. I get like really bad panic attacks. Sure. And I'm like, please don't touch, like, don't touch my stuff. Yeah. Don't do it. And then it just like sets me off and it gets really bad. Yeah, right. And a lot of the times, I mean, a lot of us have preferences or things that way, but they can go beyond a preference where it causes you issues if they're just rapidly similar. So, yeah. Um, I'm really interested. <laughs> and I'm the opposite. Like, yeah. don't touch my drawers are a mess. Oh. Um, it's a disaster. Don't look at my closet. Oh. <laughs> it, it does make sense. So okay. Um, so mm -hmm. that be a thing to get out yeah. yeah. One of my old best friends, she was diagnosed with OCD. Yeah. And none of us had expected it because we thought like OCD was like clean, cleanliness, locking doors, but she did not care. She was nervous if yeah. windows open, doors on the screen. Hers was a relative to how people perceived her. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so she was obsessed with checking how she looked. Yeah. In her phone camera all the time. I never saw her with something in her teeth, even though she would always be on it, like the minute after eating. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, she would, one of the things that she would do, oh, like, if we all knew we were going to go to like a high school football game, we would sit in front of the mirror and practice how she was going to sit. Interesting. So that she could memorize what looked good okay what looked best and then she would do, do that whether we did or bring a giant jacket and like tie it around her it was really huh. crazy and, and we could always tell when she forgot her okay because it would be like so she would work yeah it's kind of the day she did kind of like some other portion of shit yeah it was not we didn't know that obsessive compulsive disorder would be like yeah, like yeah, no, it was about like how people because you think of this kind of stuff, right? Like most of the time, but I'm glad you shared that it can be related to anything, any kind of like obsession leading to any kind of compulsion. And so, yeah, it can look like that, it can look like the traditional 
emotional stuff that we're talking about here. It can be a balance related thing. Um, there's a lot of ways this can present. You had your hand up too, yeah. So question is like, I always thought that my aunt had like OCD and she just had that if I like move something even just a little bit, she like move it right back in place. And that goes like for the whole house. Um, but where does like this OCD of like, like that cleanliness or like fixing like little tiny things? Yeah. So interesting, there's a disorder called OCPD. Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. And what you just described is that, not, not this. But they're super confusing. I mean, they're practically named the same thing, right? So Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder is when people have to have everything just so. So like that stapler right here, if I moved it, well, that moved a lot, right? <laughs> that would be really, really annoying to some of the family back the way it was, just in case. Uh, but people who have OCPD, and I have lots of stories to share with you when we get to that, uh, that one, everything has to be perfect. So like all labels facing the same direction, right? Everything like has to be moved a certain way. Cleanliness tends to go with that order and control versus this is more like a disturbing thought followed by a compulsion to prevent it. Uh, but they're very similar and very commonly used. So, yeah. Um, now that you just said that, I yeah. think it's more so what you just said. Sure. But I, I mean, I still do this to this day. Um, like with my x like at least at night like so i can't go to sleep unless the blankets are like all smoothed out like he's not even like a wrinkle or anything mm -hmm. time, he was the type that like he would kick off the blanket and i have to wake up and fix it <laughs> and oh my god i have to do that like 10 times at night i'm laughing because you just described like my partner and myself like <laughs> I'm the kicker of blankets and she's the like, everything has to be perfect. I drive her nuts every night and it's just like that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it can be, it can be like a lot of different presentations. Yeah. And then I want to um, show you a clip, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Somewhere. Right. Freud talked a lot about uh, being anal retentive, right? Literally retaining your feces and control over like going the bathroom during potty training. And so there was a lot of thought for years that potty training could have a correlation to adult behavior with anxiety and being like obsessive compulsive or anal retentive, having everything have to be a certain way. Not a lot of basis to that, but there is still a lot of like developmental theories related to potty training, but not as much with OCD as maybe he proposed. Well, we see a lot more, uh, this is a big one here, the behavioral piece. From a behavioral model, we're only worried about the behavior, right? So from this perspective, we're concerned with the compulsions, the behaviors. And what we can do is we can try and break the cycle by stopping the behaviors from happening. Now, this causes people a lot of anxiety. This is what I did to my poor student. You're not going to go out to your car anymore. Again, sweating and upset, right? But it can stop the cycle because what's going on here is the behaviors are being reinforced. Every time you do that behavior and something bad doesn't happen, that behavior worked in your head, okay? So you got to stop that in order to break the cycle. And we call this exposure and response prevention. We expose you to something that causes you anxiety, and then we prevent you from doing the response that would make you feel better. And what you learn is that nothing bad happens and we can break that cycle. Now, if something bad were to happen, make it exponentially harder to treat. But most of the time, that's not the case, right? But obviously something could go wrong in, in theory. Yeah. Like to do this, so that be like kind of maybe the same type of thing you can with OCD. Uh, I mean, it's a compulsion. So here's this, and then if you did the compulsion, it's like yeah, let's continue to try to work on that. Yeah, it's a degree of it, right? Like it's definitely along those lines of like, we're going to try and have you not do that. And then reward you when you do the behaviors we do like, you know, very behavioral, right? In nature, that kind of, um, those little interventions like that tend to be really successful, especially with children who need like a very concrete uh, thing to follow. Let me show you what this looks like with Stephanie. Uh, I just had doubt that that was her name. <laughs> yeah, okay. Making up names for people now. Uh, but with Stephanie, see the progress from something like that. And oftentimes with a lot of anxiety disorders, it's that fear of doing it that is worse than anything else, right? And so the second that you break that cycle, making her touch the couch and like 
that, I find that gross. And like, I'd have to clean the cows afterward, but that's okay. Um, not, not my problem here, but uh, I want to clean it after. But we break the cycle for her. She's able to kind of move past it. It makes huge changes for her. So we can approach things from a very behavioral perspective. This tends to be very successful. We also look at cognitive and biological elements. This one has four different models that tend to play a role. So people blame themselves for unwanted thoughts and things happening. It's those like, uh, again, that superstitious thinking. So focusing on, you know, what are some of the thoughts that you're having? How logical is it to assume that if you do X, Y will happen, right? And kind of really working through all of that. And then they mentioned that she's on Prozac. Sometimes people have low levels of serotonin when they have obsessive compulsive disorder. And so giving them a medication that increases serotonin like Prozac or like an antidepressant, for example, um, can help with that as well. So relatively common that people might take um, like a medication like an antidepressant, in addition to looking at the thinking patterns, what are the thoughts you're having, and then exposure and response prevention. All of those together tend to be really good. If you want to break the cycle on your own, just force yourself to not perform the behavior. Maybe it's not every time. That might be a lot to start with. But if you normally like check five times, try and check three today or four today, right? Like just a little bit at a time. And you can usually get yourself um, along those lines, right? It, even without the help of a therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah they have to be ready for it right <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 it's tough I mean sometimes uh I, you know you can nudge the people in your lives and try and help them but if they're not ready and they're not in that place which it sounds like she clearly wasn't uh yeah it can lead to a lot of anger and and uh difficulty right uh people hold on to these things strongly and it could take some time to let them let them go right it's not always the easiest yeah. So with the OCD, um, are we going to be talking about like how, um, like, wait, sorry, my brain just stopped working. That's okay. Oh, wait, okay, no, I remember my, yes. So OCD is a form of neurodivergency, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, that's one way of looking at it, right? Yeah, that maybe, um, you know, your mind isn't working in like the typical way that everyone else's is, right? There's a lot of, uh, it's kind of a, a popular phrase right now, right, of uh, people thinking in a neurodivergent sort of way. Um, and so you can view it that way, in a sense. Yeah, I think you could view any, you know, one suffering from a mental illness as being kind of neurodivergent in a way if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're out of time. I have a couple of uh, like really small, like I won't say they're small, but they're like side disorders that are related to this. So we'll talk about these really briefly next time. And then we'll move on to chapter five, uh, which is related to stress and trauma. So we'll look a little bit at how stress affects the body and then um, traumatic related disorders. Uh, and then uh, don't forget that the paper is due by tonight. All right. So submit that on Canvas really brief, but get that in. And then uh, start preparing for the exam. The study guide's on Canvas. You could start like getting ready. Have a wonderful weekend. Go Mahomes, right? And the Super Bowl. I'll see you all uh, next week. One through five for the exam. Yeah, because we'll cover five on uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's up? Yeah.